Hi class, in this recording we're going to focus on muscles of the head, neck, and trunk. I have your weekly lab objective sheet pulled up here, and I've highlighted a couple of them yellow on this sheet. And the reason I highlighted them yellow is because there's some differences, there's some little distinctions I want to highlight specifically between how they're listed on the sheet and how they're viewed in visible body. So let's get started with the head and neck. Whoa, what is my computer doing here? Uh, let's try that again. Tap, tap. There we go. It works. All right. So getting started, we have the front talus and occipitalis on our lab objective sheet. And as we are looking at that lab objective sheet, uh, I want to emphasize for you invisible body, the occipitalis and front talus are merged as one muscle. So let me get rid of that fascia right there. So here we have the invisible body. They call it the occipital front talus or epicranius. Uh, other lab manuals, other texts separate these muscles. So as we're looking at this, if I have just this anterior muscle over the frontal bone highlighted, I want to hear occipitalis, excuse me, front talus for your answer. And then conversely, if I, let's go ahead and rotate this here. If I have these belly, the occipital bellies over here of the muscle highlighted, I want to, you to give me occipitalis for your answer if I have those highlighted on the lab exam. Uh, we also have the temporalis and masseter. Those are a little bit more straightforward. Oop, let me clear that. I don't want a little marker there. There we go. So as we're looking at the temporalis, that is going to be the large muscle that goes over the temporal bone and is covering the temporal region of the, your body at, or of your skull. As we look at the masseter, it's the muscle of mastication. Invisible body, we have a superficial and a deep massacre. Masseter, <laughs> not massacre, masseter. Um, so if we have these guys highlighted, we can either have just the superficial masseter highlighted, or we might highlight with a multi-select and show both masseters highlighted. You, we don't want you to differentiate between superior and inferior, or super, excuse me, superficial or deep. Uh, we just want you to collectively know them as the masseters. We also have the orbicularis oculi and orbicularis oris. This word here, orbicularis, means that we have a roundish muscle. Think of an or a planet in its orbit going around the sun. These are muscles that go around an opening. One of the openings is oculi or eye. The other is oris or oral, which means mouth. So with invisible body here, the orbicularis oculi are right here. They are the eye muscles. And then here around the mouth is the orbicularis oris, the, the muscle of the lips. So when you pucker your lips together, that's your orbicularis oris in action. We also have the buccinator or buccinator. As we look at the buccinator, the buccinator is frequently mixed up with the masseter. So here we have, it's a deeper muscle right here. Um, it's the deep muscle that we have within the face that will help us to compress the cheeks. So the buccinator is here. Uh, so we look at the masseter. Focus on a muscle that connects the zygomatic bone to the mandible for mastication or elevating the mandible, whereas the buccinator is going to be focused on our cheeks and compressing the cheeks. We also have the zygomaticus. On your lab objective sheet, we have the zygomaticus listed as one muscle. In visible body, it's going to be two separate muscles. We have zygomaticus major and, oops, wrong one there, zygomaticus minor. So we have a major minor here in visible body. So if you see them both highlighted, I want you to just give me zygomaticus as an answer. Um, or if just one of them is highlighted, probably the major because of the bigger one, just give me zygomaticus for the answer on your lab exam. And then we have the sternocleidomastoid. I love this muscle. This is a muscle that name that just tells it all. This is a muscle that um, originates at the sternum, goes over the clavicle, cluteo meaning clavicle, and then attaches to the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So while we're looking at this bone, excuse me, <laughs> this muscle, let's go ahead and find that mastoid process. There's the mastoid process right behind the ear, or directly posterior to the ear. There is our sternocluteomastoid. Uh, there's an, another muscle over the top of it. 
the platysma. I'll go ahead and hide it so you can really get a good view of that sternocleidomastoid. It's right here at the sternum and clavicle and then up to the mastoid process for the sternocleidomastoid. So those are the muscles of the head that we want you to be able to commit to memory for lab. We also have some muscles of the trunk we want you to know. And uh, there's a lot of talking points there with these. So let's go ahead and go ahead and just flip over here and highlight the trunk. So while we're looking at the trunk here, we have external and internal obliques. Um, uh, right here, these most superficial muscles are the external obliques. And I want to highlight or emphasize the fiber orientation. Muscle fibers are all going to be oriented um, so that as they travel medially, they're always going to be traveling inferiorly. Uh, so they kind of head down towards the midline, to use more common English. Let me clear that out here. Um, and if I go ahead and remove that, we can now see the, uh, instead of the external obliques, we'll have the internal obliques. And these internal obliques will have a different muscle fiber orientation. Instead of all the fibers being relatively parallel with each other, they have more of a radiating pattern. And the radiation point is going to be right here with the iliac crest. And the fibers tend to radiate. Ooh, that was really, that wasn't a good. Let me try that again here. So here we have our iliac crest. The fibers tend to radiate outward from the iliac crest for the internal oblique. And let me get my little pointer here. So you can see the fiber orientation. And I overemphasize that radiating pattern with my green annotation. As we're looking at the rectus abdominis, that's our six pack muscle, even though there's one, two, three, four on each side, eight total lobes to it. So if somebody's really ripped, you can see their eight pack instead of their six pack. Uh, those days are far, far behind me. Uh, it's been many years since the six packs come out of the fridge. Uh, as we're looking at uh, our next muscles, we have the transverse abdominis and rectus abdominis. So I just covered the rectus abdominis, your six pack muscle, and then we have the transverse abdominis. And I'm going to remove the internal obliques to really highlight the muscle fiber orientation of the transverse abdominis. The fibers tend to go from left to right across the abdomen. They transversely go across. So if I was to make a slice, uh, particularly right here, if I was to make a slice right here along those muscle fibers, that would be a transverse slice across the abdomen. That's why we call this the transverse abdominis, because they transverse the abdomen. The name kind of makes sense when you see those fibers. I just want to reiterate. I am not smart enough to memorize all these things verbatim. I like to play kind of a, a word puzzles with these names. So I look at a name like transverse abdominis, and I would look at the root words to figure out what the heck I'm trying to find. So as we look at this guy right here, serratus anterior, this is a muscle that's on the anterior of the body, and it has a serrated or zigzaggy pattern. So let's go ahead and look at our figure here, invisible body. I'm going to go ahead and reset this just so we can have all the muscles shown. There we go. So here's our torso with all the muscles, and we can see over here the serratus anterior. These muscles uh, are going to be towards the anterior of the body, although if you ask me, they're kind of lateral. I would prefer to have them called the serratus lateralis, but serratus anterior is what made it into the literature. And while we're looking at the serratus anterior, let me go ahead and remove the deltoid as well here. We can see these muscles that zigzag back and forth. They form a serrated pattern and they move towards the anterior of the torso, hence the name serratus anterior. And then finally, we have the diaphragm. As we look at our diaphragm, this is the muscle of breathing in, the muscle of inspiration. And we're going to have to do some dissections here to get to the diaphragm. So I'm removing the external obliques, the rectus abdominis, the internal obliques, 
the transverse abdominis, and now I can see into the abdominal pelvic cavity. Let's get rid of that linea alba, the white line, and expose the diaphragm, which is right here. This is the muscle that separates the abdominal pelvic cavity from the thoracic cavities. And when this muscle is contracted, we'll get more to this in A and P2, but I did, well, we're here. I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize how this muscle arches upward, and when it contracts, it moves downward, causing our thoracic cavity to increase in volume and, and for us to inhale. It's the muscle of inspiration. So that's all we have for this video. We have the muscles of the head, neck, and trunk from your lab objective sheets. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the class discussion boards or do shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.